This is the uh, September Rules Committee meeting. Uh, this time I call the meeting to order. Uh, Councilor Buzzard, would you bless the meeting? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here today to conduct a business in Cherokee Nation, we ask that you keep your hand upon us, keep us uh, in, in spirit to, uh, to award and to uh, recognize the people that uh, have gone on before us uh, for today. We ask, thank you for our safe traveling to come to these meetings, and uh, we ask you for safe traveling home. We also ask you to keep your hand upon our servicemen that are here in the United States and those who serve abroad. We ask that, that you keep your hand upon them to make sure that they all return home safely. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Roll call, Shelly. Yes, sir. Honey. Honey. Keith Austin. Here. Harley Buzzard. Here. Julia Here. Tom Crittenden. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Joe here. Oh, crazy. Mike here. Dobbins. Here. Jordan. Here. Daryl A. Here. Wesson O'Fire. Honey. Dora Petskowski. Here. Mike Shambaugh. Here. Mary Baker Shore. Honey. E.O. Smith. Here. Denise Taylor. Here. Victoria Vesquick. Honey. We have a four. Thank you, Shelley. This time I entertain approval of the minutes. Make a motion they be approved. Okay. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Dropping down the reports uh, uh, for Marshall Shannon Buell. I think we have Scott Craig with us. Good morning. Uh, the real time has been provided, and I'm here to try to answer any questions. Shannon was unable to attend today. Any questions for our marshal service? I see none, so uh, thank you very much. We let you off easy today. Mm -hmm. That's right. Y'all have a good day. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Office Attorney General, Sarah Hill. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to be here today. Um, I don't have as extensive a report um, as I did last time. I'll just do some quick updates on it. Um, I told you at the last rules meeting that on um, July 28th, the federal district court ruled in favor of the tribes in the gaming case. Um, yesterday, the court issued its final order which is just sort of a legal process of taking his decision and cutting out the issues which can be appealed. So the final order has been issued in that case, and so the clock will begin to run on the appeal time for the governor's office. Um, on the illegal compacting issue, I mentioned last time that the uh, Kailiji Tribal Town and the United Katua Band had also entered into compacts with the governor that we felt had legal issues. Um, over the last month, we have um, added them to our complaint that we filed in the uh, district court in Washington, D.C. So now we've added the, uh, we had the Comanche and the Otoe, Missouri uh, chiefs and governor were the, were the first uh, two tribes involved. We also see the Secretary of the Interior, who's the person, um, the individual responsible on the United States side. But we've added those other two tribes to that litigation now. So we've added them to that complaint. Um, and federal litigation, as you all are well aware, has to take time to go through the course, and, and it will, it'll be some time probably on, on those as they take their time to get through, through the federal court system. Um, there is no issue upon which my office is working harder than the aftermath of the McGirt decision. Um, we're, we have continued to, um, there are several cases, as I mentioned in my last rules report, that have been remanded from the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals down to the district court we had our very first oral argument in one of those cases, I think it was this week on Monday, um, and we were able, there was a stipulation by the parties, the defendant and the state, that the individual who committed the crime was an Indian under the federal definition of that word. They both agreed that the crime happened inside the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation, so the only issue remaining was whether the Cherokee Nation Reservation had ever been established, and if it had been established, whether it had ever been disestablished. Um, I, of course, argued on behalf of the nation that the reservation was established, that it had never been disestablished. Oklahoma took no position on that. They didn't argue uh, for or against that issue, um, but it has been now briefed to the district court, and we are awaiting his decision in that case. 
Um, there are more coming. There's another one scheduled for Monday in Rogers County. Um, there's, there's several in most of the districts. So I will continue to be driving up to all of those hearings and, and offering argument um, on the Cherokee reservation issue. Okay. There are also hundreds of other cases, um, very small cases and very large cases um, in various status all over the Cherokee Nation. And we're tracking all those to the best of our ability. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't have a decision from the um, Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals uh, before Christmas. Um, it, may, it could be much quicker than that. It could be longer. It's, I, I can't control um, the timeline upon which the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals will hear these issues, but it will certainly br be briefed and completely to them by the end of November. Um, so it, it could well be, um, be here before Christmas. So we continue to work. Um, we've had a couple of meetings of the Sovereignty Commission. Um, that work continues and you've got um, delegates to that, those meetings and we're continuing to put together information to address these issues um, and, and doing the best that we can to, to get ready for what we know will be a very big, uh, a very big load of cases when the court finally makes its decision and those cases begin to get transferred to the nation. Um, and that's my fairly brief for me uh, rules report and I will answer any questions that I can. <coughs> Yes, Council Leg. Uh, sir, I got to listen to uh, Jack Thorpe. Uh, he did a chamber uh, briefing on the McGurk case yesterday, and he mentioned that I think I'm saying this right that the Creek Nation can prosecute uh, a tribal citizen for murder, but they will only do a maximum of three years. That's right. Um, first of all, I would be remiss if I did not mention how much assistance Jack Thorpe and the staff of District 27 have provided to my office. Um, they have made my job uh, much easier by being helpful and kind and, and generous with their time. I've been sending my attorneys over to their office to cross train so that we would have a better idea of what the caseload is and the procedures and processes that they use. Um, and I, I, I would, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I wanted to be sure that I passed along what great assistance his office has provided to my office. Um, yes, that's true. The nation can, has jurisdiction over any Indian who commits crimes inside the reservation boundaries, any crime, including the crime of murder. But because of the Indian Civil Rights Act, we are limited into the sentencing that we can provide for those crimes. So I can arrest them for murder and try them for murder. Uh, but if they're convicted, the maximum sentence that the nation can provide is three years and a $15,000 fine, regardless of what the crime is. And that's a federal limitation on the sentencing powers of Indian tribes. Um, we're actually fortunate that the Tribal Law and Order Act was passed several years ago um, because it gives us, it expanded our sentencing authority. Prior to that, it was one year and a $5,000 fine. Um, fortunately, the United States has concurrent jurisdiction over those crimes. The Major Crimes Act also gives them jurisdiction over that and they can um, sentence them to life without parole. So the major crimes like murder are cases that we want the United States to take uh, because then they can incarcerate those people for sentences that make sense with the crimes that they've committed. Um, and that's, but it doesn't mean that we wouldn't charge someone with murder if we had to. And it doesn't mean that we couldn't hold them on the crime of murder awaiting the federal government's action further down the road because that happens pretty regularly anyway. And it's not just murder, but all the major crimes that are listed in the Major Crimes Act. Um, and there's a whole sheet of them um, but that's, that's the way that it works. That's right. No, but, sorry. Is that good, Counselor? Yes. Sir. Anybody else? <clears throat> yes, Counselor Buzzer. Uh, Sarah, about how many trials or how many people do you think is going to be coming to you in the near future? That's an excellent question, and it's one I've put a lot of thought and energy and time into trying to determine. Um, it's difficult to do because crime statistics are not maintained according to our reservation boundaries, but according to county and city boundaries. Um, you know, my initial assessment and all, all I can do is take the, the data that OSBI has, and then I look at the number of Cherokee Nation citizens in that county, or like what it is as a percentage. And then I presume that Indians commit crimes at roughly the same rate everybody else does. Um, and I can put together some estimates. Um, it's really, it's very difficult to know because Tulsa County is a particularly touchy one because two thirds of Tulsa County is out of our jurisdiction. But the, the third of it that is, um, is very well populated. And even though they have a relatively small number of total Cherokees because their population is so high, it still makes a major impact on the bottom line. 
Um, and all of these are issues that we're still trying to work through to get a good grasp on. There will certainly be um, many thousands of cases that will come to the Cherokee Nation, many, many thousands of cases in a year. Um, and many, some of those cases will be um, that the United States could prosecute because of their Major Crimes Act jurisdiction. And many of them the United States could prosecute but will not prosecute because they have their hands full with murder and the, more, the most serious crimes on the reservation, they may not be willing to, um, to exercise their full jurisdiction. In domestic violence cases, even more of those cases will come to the Cherokee Nation probably because of VAWA, because we can exercise jurisdiction over non-Indians and only the United States can exercise jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit crimes against Indians the state has no jurisdiction over them, and, and the United States, is, again, is not going to want to deal with those cases unless they're the most serious ones. So I think the, uh, we'll get a, a really a lot of domestic violence cases for sure, uh, because we can also um, prosecute non-Indian offenders. So I, I don't have an exact number for you, but it will be many thousands of cases. Well, Sarah, I want to thank you for coming to our committee. I, mean, I know we have a story, but I really thank you for coming here in person. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Anybody else? <clears throat> Councilor Shimba? Um, so really, I, I know talking to Marshall Buell that um, a lot of our felony cases get turned down uh, because of that reason. Um, so we are really limited <coughs> on something that deserves more than three years. I mean, because if they don't take it, the attorneys, U.S. Attorney's Office don't take it, and it has to go back to tribal court. Well, that's that's kind of a that's kind of a bad deal when when maybe the crime justifies more than that, uh, especially a domestic violence crime. If it's a if they don't take it and there there was violence on and there's maiming or whatever whatever it is, you know that that's a a pretty major crime if they chose not to choose not to take it and three years is all they can they will get and probably less. I mean, what is there a percentage of what I mean, if they get sentenced in tribal court, is, is there a percentage what they have to serve? Is there is there's time served that they'd be in jail that would be there too? Or um, there's no there's nothing in the law that permits them or requires them to serve a percent, certain percentage of their time. And honestly, in my 17 years at the Cherokee Nation, we have um, never sentenced anyone to a term longer than one year. Um, so this is very much un. Uh, these are new waters that we're sort of swimming in here, um, but but that, I certainly take your point. That's why the you know the most serious cases we will always take them to the United States first and try to get them to prosecute those cases. Um, but if they can't prosecute them, then we will I will whatever authority we have we will use it uh, to protect the the citizens of the reservation and the population of the reservation. But yeah, it's it's a limitation that does cause problems. We can also stack charges. Um, up to nine years. So if they commit multiple felonies, I can I can charge them with those felonies individually and stack that time so that they have to serve nine years. Um, but again, if you you know, there are crimes for which nine years is not sufficient. Well, I guess if um, uh, that, that's good for me. I was just going to say if we if we if we are going to have our own system too, uh, I mean, are we going to be have like the mandates of like like a uh, federal federal system or a state system where there is a percentage that you have to you know because you I don't think incarceration is always the right answer you know and but if you do um, are we going to have are we going to kind of model it after that where they do a percentage of time or anything or do you think it'll be straight out or is it too early to tell? I think it's too early to tell. I mean, the reason why the the, the states, uh, you know, a lot of the states prefer to have, you know, they don't like to have those minimums is because it gives them flexibility based on the crime, based on their own outlays that they have, the, the, the populations of their prisons. They may need to release some people. So if you have really strict rules, sometimes that limits your flexibility. Um, it's, I think it's too early to tell because we don't, we've never had to deal with issues of what do we do with a prisoner we've had in jail five years before. Um, and those are certainly issues that the Sovereignty Commission is sort of highlighting as decision points for the elected leaders that you all will have to consider moving forward. Um, what are our priorities going to be? 
Um, if we do put someone in jail for nine years, you know, that, that's a significant cost to the nation to put someone in detention for nine years. Um, and it's a cost that you have to carry from one year to the next. Um, so those are all issues that I think that this body and the elected leaders of the nation will have to wrestle with. Certainly, you know, I will put forward all the facts and all of the, make all the recommendations that I, I think I can to you. So when you consider those, you'll have different points of view. Well, I'd like to thank you for all that you guys have done and you've really been, I mean, you've thought of a lot of things and, and there's so much to think about that people really don't know what this entails. And wow, you're getting into cost and law things. So you guys are, you've really been, um, you've thought ahead and I'd just like to commend you for that. It's no less than the nation deserves or will need in the coming years for sure. We're happy to do it. <clears throat> are you good? Yes, sir. Yes. Councilor Cope. Thank you. Um, this may or may not be related to the parent very much because I think that may be dealing with more serious problems. But Councilor Shambaugh's remark um, about incarceration not being the solution necessarily to everything. And I have yeah. um, often wondered, um, and I don't know, maybe we do, but have we do we have programs or are we thinking around um, um, restorative justice? Um, the kinds of things that may be sort of culturally related or socially related to our specific communities that um, where people could be really sort of um, corrected and integrated and brought back into alignment with kind of community values and things like that. Um, because I know this is something that is um, that is rising in India country generally. And I didn't, I hadn't heard at least, maybe I'm just out of the loop for a while, but uh, if we had thoughts about anything like that. Um, I would like to say that I have had the luxury of having to have thoughts on restorative justice at this point, Councilwoman. Um, I have not. For the most part, my primary focus is, you know, how do we make sure that if someone commits a serious crime in our communities and they need to be detained, that we have everything in place to make sure that that person is detained so they don't go out and offend again against someone else. Um, I think all those questions are good questions. And I've got a long list of things that are my A, burning priorities that I have to address right now questions that are important but that I can't get to right now and questions which are you know further down the list than that, that that will be important eventually but are not important at this moment to me. And it's not that restorative justice isn't important to me but the, the overwhelming issues of having to deal with this expansion of jurisdiction and making sure I do have detention solutions available when they are needed has been my overriding concern. So I would like to have that conversation with you in maybe about 12 months uh, when we're in a position to, to sit down and think those issues through in a little bit more detail. So I, I understand the issue and the point and I appreciate it. I, 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 that's what I said. I, I have a feeling you're dealing with more serious crimes, you know, than restorative justice would really be appropriate to address, but it was a, a, a thought I had. And then just to follow up on that, is the AG's office um, anticipating ramping up in employment <laughs> soon? You're, I've got uh, positions available now. If there are any uh, Indian lawyers working now who are watching now who would like to be uh, would like to come here and help us with this uh, great job we've got here. Um, yeah, we are hiring now paralegal, and I had some open positions that I hadn't filled yet, so I've opened all of them, um, and I'm sure that there will have to be more hiring done eventually. Those are all again topics that we are sort of addressing. Um, in our meetings um, our, with our sovereignty commission meetings and which we hopefully will be able to write a more full report of about those meetings to the council in the near future you've got a lot on your plate and i appreciate everything you're doing thank you thank you anybody else <clears throat> yeah um, sarah we have a young lady from your department attorney general's office that is uh, stationed in the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Muskogee, correct? Yes, sir. Can I, I would like, if, it's, if it meets your approval, to have her here next month just to give us a little bit of update on what they're dealing with out of that, that office there. Is that okay? I will discuss it with her. Okay. I think it would be very informative to see what cases they're dealing with and just give us the pros and cons on and, and what, they're, and, you know, what kind of caseload they have. And, and I think... The, the committee would really appreciate that. Okay. Anybody else? Real quick. Councilor Leg. Uh, I'd, I'd like to know what our budget is for incarcerating folks if we have to pay for that bed space. 
uh, where where do they go? Do they go to a federal unit? Do they go to a state? Do they go to the county? We pay for bed space. There, um, our current budget for detention is about forty thousand dollars a year. I think forty. Yeah. Forty. Yeah. Two people. <laughs> Uh, that's about what it is. Yeah. Um, the uh, they they don't we have contracts with with county jails and we have always had contracts I think with Mays. Um, I mean there's several local you know sort of spread out throughout the 14 counties. Uh, Shannon has been working hard to get a, a, to get at least one detention contract in every single county um, of the Cherokee Nation because I think we, we're going to need them. Um, and then for longer term detention, you know, I think we're still working through some of those issues for people that need to be, you know, if they're going to go to prison for three years, they need a different setting than county jail probably. Um, there are some BIA operated facilities that can take prisoners. Um, most, they are not located in Oklahoma. They are located in, uh, I think the closest one is in Albuquerque. So that provides its own set of challenges, uh, transporting people to Albuquerque and then people being detained so far from where they where their community is, their family is. Um, and those are all issues that we are currently wrestling with. And that is probably, that, that is the, the best answer that I have for you right now. I, I'm certain that $40,000 is not going to be sufficient. Thank you. Anybody else? Sarah, we really appreciate you and your staff and what you do. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Gwen Terrapin. I see her on the screen. Good afternoon. It's good to see all of you. See Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, for the year, we have six total FOIA requests. One of those is outstanding. We don't have any GRA requests. And the website's been updated, and you guys have a report. Okay. Any questions for Gwen? All right, you're good. Thank you. Thank you. Tax Commission, Sharon Swepston. <coughs> Sharon, are you on? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you now. <laughs> Go ahead. You do have my report. Um, I'll try to entertain any questions that you might have. <clears throat> any questions for our tax commission? Can you give us any highlights on what you, what's been going on in your area? Um, the tax commission this month has actually, the in-person visits have slowed down that I have noticed. But of course, it's in the middle of, get toward the end of the month there. So we were, we're going to be sending out the renewal cards and I'm sure that'll pick back up. But I think everybody has kind of gotten into the procedure that we now have and everything. And so I think it's running a lot smoother than it, than it was. It just took a matter of everybody getting used to the processes and stuff. Okay. All right. Not any questions? Yes, Councillor Shaw. Hi, Sharon. Sharon, are we still Hi. doing the groundbreaking ceremony next week for the, the new location? Yes, at, on uh, September 30th at 2 o'clock. All right, did you get your answer, Councillor Shaw? Yes, I did. Thank Do you. we have that a new person hired in the J area? We actually had picked someone and it didn't work out and so we re-interviewed and we have made a selection and so hopefully we will have someone there real soon. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next, Gaming Commission, Janice Purcell. Anybody from the Gaming Commission? All right, Janice, you're up. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, we are finishing up the end of the year audit. Um, we continue to have our commission meeting by WebEx, and we are improving every month on that. Thank you to the people that have been helping us with IT from IT. And I also submitted a report if anyone has any questions. Okay, any questions for uh, our Gaming Commission? All right, thank you, Janice. Thank you. 
Human Resources, Alana Castell. Okay, Alana Castell. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, okay. Okay, I've got. Uh, you have my report in front of you. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Any questions for our human resources? Yes, Councilor Deer. I was wondering, have we sped up the process yet on hiring? We're still getting a lot of calls about. People applying and not hearing anything back. Um, we are trying. Uh, right now, we are down staff in our background area. Um, so uh, we've, we've tried to fill in, but we've lost one of our employees that was a fill in for us. So uh, unfortunately, we're not moving any faster, but we are trying. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Human Resources, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, dropping down to old business, none pending. New business, uh, number one, Councilor Vasquez, you wanna take that? Yeah, this is a resolution confirming the reappointment of, <clears throat> excuse me, Vivian Garner Cottrell as an advisory committee member of the Cherokee Nation National Treasures Program I put that in the form of a motion. I second. A motion for Vivian Cottrell. Got a motion second. Any questions? Somebody had a sponsor. Okay. Hey, well. Shelley. Shelley. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, we got a motion and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay. <laughs> Next, Councillor Duncan, would you take that? Yes, sir, this is a resolution confirming the reappointment of Burl Keeter, an advisory member of Cherokee Nation National Treasures Program. I put that in the form of a motion. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'd like to be added as a sponsor. I'd like to be added as a sponsor. Everybody again? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, aye. ayes have it. <coughs> Councillor Austin, would you take the next one? This is a resolution confirming the appointment of Kinder McGee as a member of the Cherokee Nation Gaming Commission. I put this in the form of a motion. Okay. A second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Councillor Legg, item number four. This is a resolution authorizing a limited waiver of sovereign immunity in connection with the Oklahoma Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust Cooperative Agreement. And I'll put that in form of a motion. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? I just had one, one Yes, question. Councilor Taylor. Um, I don't know who, Tim might be able to answer this. Is this just um, dealing with choice of law and choice of venue, that's, that's all it is, so that we can receive grants? Okay. So, Good, okay. You had a motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it. Number five, Councilor Legg, you want to take that? You bet. This, this is an act relating to the naming of the Sally Bird Seven Star Community Center. And I'll put that in form of a motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? I would like to be added as a sponsor on this. Well. Okay. Everybody? Go ahead. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank all the committee for that vote. I know the family will be very honored by that. Well done. Can we have a sponsor? Can we, can we call that by acclamation? Yes. Uh, motion by acclamation. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well done. All right. Item number six, Cherokee Heritage Center Act of 2020. Uh, Councillor Vasquez, you want to take that? <clears throat> yes. Okay. This is an act for the Cherokee Heritage Center Act of 2020. Move for its approval. Second. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Sponsor. Sponsor. 
Sponsor. Sponsor. Everybody. Everybody. Good deal. Long time coming. By acclamation. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Number seven, Councillor Dobbins, you want to take that? Yes, I would like to make a motion to approve uh, version four, if you should have received today, version four, as handed out in a piece of legislation. Uh, hopefully, have that. And hopefully most, most of you have been feel we've been updated throughout this process. I asked our attorney today, when do we start this? It was last September when this actually started. So uh, hopefully you feel like you've been updated and, and informed along the way. Uh, it's been a joint effort of many, including all but just a few counselors have been to a meeting. So all but just a few have been here. And uh, we've also received input from the Election Commission, our Attorney General, Marshal Service, uh, as well. We never took any votes, but progressed when a general agreement was reached on certain issues. And uh, I think most, if not all, the work group <coughs> would admit that this work was not 100% of what any of us wanted. <coughs> and I had to swallow hard. Uh, and, and vote on certain things. It's not, we couldn't get 100% of what each of us wanted. But uh, we had a dedicated group of counselors willing to serve on this effort. In fact, all our meetings were in-person meetings, so it was a challenge for each of us to travel and get here as well. But uh, that's all I have to say. Certainly willing to open it up for discussion. I second if you have well, a motion. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a motion. <laughs> Let's clarify some things first here. Now, so Councillor Dobbins, uh, uh, thank you for for serving as as a chair and leading the group. You know, this this was a very difficult task, and uh, we've had several work groups in the tribe, but I'm not sure there's one any more essential and important as this one here. I know it's tedious, and you guys met, and uh, and there were no votes taken. I want the, everyone to know in, uh, out of the work group. And so now we said, whatever you come up with, the recommendations, bring it back to the full council. So we put that trust in you and you did just that. So now, Councilor Duncan, you got a comment? I, I just want to add to that. Uh, you know, I, I said in on most of them. Uh, Councilor Dobbins kept us on task. Uh, he did a lot of, uh, of the, the logistical work and, and putting things together after we discussed. So I appreciate it. But it looks like the Attorney General wants to say something like Okay, now, <clears throat> before we get started with Attorney General, we, did we have a motion? You made a motion? Yes, I think And we had a second? Yeah. Okay, we're in discussion. All right. AG. Thank you for giving me a chance to address you on this issue. I just want to say that I witnessed firsthand the hard work that went into this, and I, I had a, one of the meetings that we talked about a lot of difficult issues, and it was it was thoughtfully done and with a lot of, uh, a lot of difficulty, so I appreciate the effort that went into it. Um, I did have three suggestions um, that we you know looking at it back in in the AG's office that we wanted to bring to you for consideration um, the first of them is, is 21 CNCA section 72 um, and it has language in section 72 This is a, 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 and all of these I think are relatively minor changes, but the, on section 72, it says in there, um, that the, this language says that it gives the election commission the discretion to discard a ballot in the instance described in there. Um, and the proposed change would be to give them the discretion to mark a ballot invalid and not to discard it. Mm -hmm. um, the idea being that discarding ballots is just typically, uh, there's no way to go back and, and check those to see why the decision was made on it that it was if it's challenged later by a court so a, a minor change would be there to change it from saying discard it to just say marked as invalid um, instead of and so that's that language is in blue and the version that we passed out is just a, a minor change so that the ballot would not be discarded um, that's one recommendation the second one is over in section 78 uh, which is the return of absentee ballots and the suggestion there is to um, allow them to be returned until 7 o'clock on election day. Um, and that would just be, again, this is our suggestions to the tribal council. 
Uh, but that would give people an opportunity, people who have those ballots, and let's say there's some issue with mail and people don't have confidence that their mail is going to be delivered, they would have until 7 o'clock on election day to hand deliver that ballot, um, just to be very protective of the individual right to vote. And then on section 105, um, which is, I think, close to the very last section, there, is, there was language in there originally which said um, to, that, that off, people, individuals from the Office of the Attorney General, including myself, including any Assistant Attorney General, and other staff employees of the Cherokee Nation Attorney General's Office may not openly endorse and or contribute to any candidate for elective office. Um, I would propose to you that that is sort of vague language and that it includes too many people. Um, the language that I have inserted in here instead is language that comes from the editorial board. They are likewise not permitted to be engaged in uh, political activity and I have no qualms with that. Um, but I think that the language of that is extremely broad. What does it mean to openly endorse a candidate for elective office? Um, if I have a, a clerk in my office who, who likes uh, you know, the principal chief's webpage, is that openly endorsing that person? Um, if they mention to their friends that they are going to vote for someone or their family, is that open endorsement? I think it's not clear what that means. And it, and it binds everyone in my office um, from, you know, someone who does the bogus, bogus check register all the way up to, to me. And so I, would, I think that the language that we've already used previously with other commissions might be a better fit there. Um, also, it doesn't say anything about tribal office. It just says a candidate for elective office. Um, and I just, I think it's a little more clear to just say, we're talking about tribal political activity. If I want to go out and uh, endorse uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, uh, certainly I don't think that this council means to restrain anyone on my staff from doing that, if that's what they personally want to do in their personal life. Um, so I, that's the reason for the, the recommendation there. I, I certainly understand and discuss with the committee at length their, their purpose and their reasoning behind that, and I understand it. And my intent by submitting this language to, I think, is just to clarify and to keep it more on track with the language we've <coughs> used in other commissions where the council has chosen to limit the activity, the political activity of people in a certain office, which I do understand. So I think those are relatively minor changes and I just wanted to make those suggestions and also to both thank the, the committee for their hard work and, and to thank you for giving me an opportunity to make that brief statement. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is first, I want to yield to uh, uh, Councillor Dobbins or anybody from the work group to, to comment on why these were well, put in the election code. Is that fair enough, committee? Okay, Councilor Dobbins. I'd just like to ask our attorney to perhaps uh, explain uh, how we got to this point with that verbiage on the, the attorney general's office. Uh, so I might ask uh, Tim, our attorney Tim, to explain. Can we start with the top first? Can we? Well, let's see, yeah, the other we could address all those. Uh, Can we start with the discard and the ballot? Why don't we just go, you know, one, two, three. I, I think that specifically the, the first one is fine. But here, to start off with, the, um, my, my only issue is that literally I was just handed these changes seconds before I came up here. Um, and I think that that we've talked as a council collectively uh, many times about this, that we were trying to get this to a point where we didn't need to amend it on the floor because it was gonna get too complicated. Uh, I think that, uh, I, I respect the, the, the AG's uh, recommendations. I think she could bring them back next, mo next month and we could make those changes uh, after we've had time to actually look at them. But to try to analyze them on the floor, you know, last second, <coughs> it makes it really challenging. Uh, but uh, to, to that point, uh, speakers asked me to discuss specifically, uh, number one, uh, I, don't, I really don't think that there's any problem with that change. Uh, okay. Number two, uh, we talked about that extensively. That, that had to do with ballot dumping. And the work group, I mean, I, I'd be willing to estimate that we spent 10 hours talking about ballot dumping. And so I think that one, uh, there was a general agreement that we were trying to eliminate as much ballot dumping as possible. Uh, I think we, there was a general agreement that uh, if we put it on Thursday, it still allowed citizens uh, the ability to 
you know, to bring their ballots in uh, or their absentee ballots in, but it also would uh, reduce the strain on the election commission to try to to count all the absentee ballots that were being dumped on them on election day at, at the last minute. Uh, and that was the reason for that. So uh, that was something that, and we've talked about that extensively. Uh, we've talked to the AG about that uh, to some degree. Uh, she came in and spoke to us. Uh, we've been trying to keep her in the loop as we've moved along. Uh, number three, the language. Uh, I want to go specifically elective office is a defined term. Uh, so it actually is not broad. It is actually defined as principal chief, deputy chief, and council. And so that's one of those things that, you know, we actually did look at that, uh, but it's really subject to uh, your discretion as the AG or the futures. Uh, the, the council cannot go in and literally police the AG. All we can do is provide the laws. So um, I think the language is what it is. Uh, if the AG has recommendations for changing these things that we've uh, discussed, I would recommend that she present them to the work group uh, and allow us to, to look at it uh, or present it, you know, in a more timely fashion to allow us to uh, look at these things and we can go back and amend this. We can amend it next, next month. We have actually or two... Or it could be tabled. Or you, you could table it, what, whatever is... But the, the reason that we're trying to do it today is because the election commission said in order to enact these changes uh, prior to the next election they needed it by september so uh, essentially tabling it would be a failure to the, the overall goal and purpose of the work group uh, but uh, again you know it's it's the legislative process and not the administrative process so sure <clears throat> okay before we go any further uh, uh, shelly just to refresh my memory maybe about anybody else would you read off the work group who was all on the work group or do you know a counselor Dobbins, do you have that in front of you no but we could raise our hands yeah. okay <laughs> well let's do it that way then okay we have counselor buzzard counselor coates counselor Dobbins, counselor pasquowski counselor duncan counselor smith counselor deer counselor crittenden okay i just okay so no. out. Okay. So all right. Well, what are the wishes? I mean, you get the work group. You're the one that put all that time into it. Your recommendations. Uh, someone make a comment. That's for Austin. Thank you. I am totally comfortable with ANC that it still meets the uh, uh, spirit of, uh, of of the uh, changes that were uh, came out of the work group. I don't think those. I really think that's meet the spirit, and I'm. Uh, I understand the reason for the the change of the definition of candidate for elective offices to Cherokee Nation, because in my book that would open you up to not being able to uh, support the sheriff or the uh, uh, state legislator, and those aren't uh, offices that we regulate or uh, uh, legislate. Uh, on B, uh, the. Uh, this, this, as all legislation is, uh, typically, it's a result of much back and forth until you come to something that enough people agree on <laughs> to, to go forward with. And, and uh, that what we proposed was, uh, uh, I, I'm comfortable with what we proposed. I, I'm not feeling that uh, that necessarily has to, uh, that I'm, endorsing that change uh, as recommended okay yeah councillor duncan yeah I, w I was gonna say the same thing I, I i would be good with um accepting one and two or one and three as um friendlies because um, i don't i mean i don't think i think they're pretty simple setting your ideals. okay councillor shambo um i would need a little more clarification on three um I, I would need that explained fully because i mean i think we're hitting on the high notes but i haven't heard everything but uh one i don't have a problem with two i do and i think in listening to everybody and, and you know we started talking about people talk about transparency and you know how do we make our elections more transparent 
And the one thing that the state does that we don't do, and this has been a problem with, with, with our system, is that they always have the um, absentee ballots cut off at a certain time. And it is way less time than we are giving, but uh, the problem our election commission was having was you know, they were getting absentee ballots after the election was over. So if they're postmarked before that uh, election is over, they, then they still get to be counted. And if you remember, there was a big uproar because a ton of absentees came in at one time uh, late. But if we're going to be transparent, I think the best way is if the cutoff is Thursday, then absentee ballots can be counted uh, just like a general election, and they can be posted what, the, what it is, early voting, can be counted and posted and now everybody in those are their own votes everybody gets to see what was voting absentees everybody gets to see what's voting early and then all you have left is the general vote and that's it is the people's choice i think that is more transparent and you can't get uh you know absentees show up later after the election's over or everything's been turned in and you get that post dated uh election ballot this should take care of that and I think it's just more transparent. I don't have a problem with, with the other one so much other than three maybe um, uh, telling us how if, if we are, if we, you know, what we can or can't do as council person, people. Yes, sir. I just wanted to clarify that uh, number three, I mean, by definition, it is only it, that language uses a defined term, elective office. Uh, those, the word is capitalized. It is defined as Cherokee Nation, Principal Chief, Deputy Chief, and Council. So th that's all it applies to. It does not apply to, to sheriff. It doesn't apply to count, county, state, any other elections. I, th I think it could be clearer, and I think it is clearer in the draft that's provided here. And also, I mean, he, he said that this would be something that would be up to the AG to enforce, but that's not what it says. It says, in, in his language, it says, a violation of this provision shall be a civil penalty as set forth herein and subject to termination of employment as may be provided by Cherokee Nation law. Um, that's, that is a, that's the penalty that you're putting on people so, who are supposed to know what openly endorse means. What does it mean to openly endorse a candidate when you're a private person who works at the Cherokee Nation? I think that language is problematic. I think the language that we substituted it for is language we've used in Cherokee Nation before because it's the language that we use for the editorial board to prevent them from, from uh, working, in, from, from getting involved in Cherokee Nation political campaigns. And I think using that language again is, is sticking with the language we know works because it's already been used before. And I think it's much clearer uh, for my folks what it is they are and are not supposed to be doing. Um, to remove me, you're gonna have to use the constitution for something that I do. Uh, but for my folks, I think this is going to give them some concern that they're going to say the wrong thing to the wrong person and they're going to get fired for openly endorsing a candidate. And I think that's problematic. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yes, Councilor Basquez. I, I would ask that we go ahead and you go ahead and take action on the Canaan's recommendations for the friendlies. I want to let everyone have an input first. We'll, we'll do that, though. Okay. Anybody else? Did, did, Councilor he, call for it? did he call for it, though? No. Okay. Councilor Deer. Uh, I'm just going off of what Councilor Shambaugh said about voting and publicly posting it up front. I think might create some kind of prejudice for the general voting. I think that might turn into an issue. That's the only comment I want to say when it comes on to that. But I'm fine with, uh, what is it, one and three. But yeah, I think that that would create prejudice in posting when you just have that general election left if you're posting those numbers previous. Okay. Councilor No Fire. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, the 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 work group that I got a chance to to sit in on a couple times, um, they they I mean we we hashed it out and we worked really hard to try to come to some form of agreement on things. And also, you know, our, our legal aid went back and made sure that every context with what we're dealing with our constitution and how we could affect something one way or the other. We also asked input from the Attorney General Office before. We asked input from the Election Commission. Everything was done and brought forth to produce this document that we had. Now the AG comes in at the, at the last hour to make their recommendations. And what I see on the recommendations that they have is nothing that would change the outcome of what we've already put forth. Um, you know, the, the third 
my comment on the third, what we were trying to do there, it's very clear because it only deals with our election. So it can't be taken out of context because it is the revised aspect of our election. So it doesn't mean that they can't openly endorse a sheriff, just like our, our legal to counsel said, because it's only specific to our election. It's an election amendment. That's what it says in that provision. Uh, the ballots, we wanted to make sure, exactly like what Shambaugh said, we wanted to make sure that we, uh, we gave um, ample time to the election commission to, to count ballots. And I think that those are wise to do. I think that, you know, what, what version we came out with as a work group and we all had a hand in trying to get something drafted that we could agree with is, is, is great from where it's at. And I don't see any reason to make any changes. So, appreciate it. Okay. Councilor Smith, do you have a comment? No, uh, Councilman Sandball about summed me up, so I'm, I'm with him on that. So. Okay. Uh, Councilor Coates. Yes, thank you. I just, I strongly agree with number one because we should not be discarding ballots. So I will say that. I do think that change uh, should be made. Um, number two, I, we talked about this for hours and hours and hours, and I agree with what other members of the work group here have said. I think that uh, there are very valid reasons for turning in, you know, the, uh, or, or putting a cutoff on the hand-delivered absentee ballots. And I want to make that clear because anybody listening might be a little bit confused at this point. We are not talking about the ballots that are being mailed in, right? The, the uh, cutoff date is, has not changed on that, right? They must be received, not postmarked, but received on elect by seven o'clock election day right so what we're talking about here is only the 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 ones that are going to be brought in by hand right and i and we had extensive discussion and there are good reasons to to put an earlier cutoff date on that in my opinion and we did have consensus on that uh, among the work group so i i would agree with sticking with the language um that we have um on the third one, I think that um, openly endorse, yes, it's kind of an ambiguous term, but I think you know, we could put that in the definitions perhaps, but uh, to me what it would mean is that if some member of the general public that you haven't had a private conversation with knows how you're voting uh, as an AG or an assistant AG, then you've openly endorsed somebody, whether it's through a sign in your yard or a bumper sticker on your car or whatever it may be, you know. Um, if some member, you know, we're not talking about a private conversation here, but if some member of the general public knows, um, then to me that's a problem because it, it does compromise the perception of bias and, in fact, the lack of bias that should be you know, present in um, in the, the attorneys from the AG's office. So, um, and as, as Mr. Brown has pointed out, elected official is number 16 under definitions here. It describes that this is only pertaining to Cherokee Nation elections. So, um, so I'm a little more torn on that one, persuadable, but I, I agree. I think that if that's something we can talk about more, um, without having to delay the passage of this overall. And it may be that uh, a month from now, after the ability to think about this and talk it over a little bit more, um, you know, I, I could be persuaded, you know, but, uh, but I would like to at least have that, uh, that opportunity. Okay, Councilor Shemba. I, <coughs> it's my fault when uh, Councilman Deere said what he said, because I, I wasn't clear enough uh, when I said about posting these, these are posted after the election is over. After every ballot has turned in and it's over, then, you know, then you can post uh, early voting and absentees. And, and at that point, it doesn't matter. It's over. So people can see this many ballots were cast here, this many ballots were cast here, and this many ballots were cast here. We don't get dumped on with 500 ballots come in at 30 seconds till time is ended. And, and you can see where the votes are. So it is transparent. They can't say that, you know, that there's been done anything wrong because it shows you up front as soon as the election's over, this is how this race is going now. It's up to these votes to determine who wins. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. And that is, that's very transparent, I think. So. Okay. Councilor Austin. Um, 
he, he clarified something I wanted to make sure it got clarified. And thank you, Mike. Uh, that, was, that was something I, I very much appreciate. Uh, the uh, definition on number three change is in line with the same, uh, oh, the same that I took when I was uh, on the editorial board before council and understood that uh, uh, there, there, there's an obligation not to participate in, uh, in political activities, political campaigns, but <coughs> you can go observe. You can actually go uh, be there. And in that instance, as I understood at that time, was in my own private yard, if I want to put a sign up, I had the right to do it as a, private, as a citizen to express my opinion, but I can't do it in such a way that somehow implies that it might my role, my official role, uh, is that I'm using that to endorse. And so that it, but, but it is in line with how, how we say it in other places within our, uh, within our uh, uh, commissions and uh, uh, boards. And uh, for, that, for that reason, I believe it is consistent with how we, with the standard we hold for other, other uh, boards and commissions. Okay. <clears throat> Let me try to clarify something here. I think Councillor Duncan was, was offering a friendly for approval of number one and three. Now I hear questions about number three. If the committee would, would choose to, we can just take each one one by one and, and vote up or down. Uh, Councillor Dobbins, is that all right with you? Sure. Go ahead, Chair. Okay. We can do that or table or we can do it right now. Uh, yes, sir. Just define friendly and then What does that mean? Okay, Councilor Duncan. It means that the sponsor would accept and you wouldn't have to vote individually. He, he made he an made offer to friendly to accept uh, the, the recommendation from the, for, from the AG number one and three. Can the sponsor would have to accept. The motion and the second would both have to agree to the friendly. So you made the motion, Councillor Austin made the second. If you two accept, then Councillor Duncan's that. motion was to offer friendly to accept number one and number three. Or we can do each one separately. Just go one, two, three. Speaker. Yes, sir. Hey, I don't have one, three, three in front of me. Can, can you just kind of have someone go over that one more time? One, three, three. I've been listening to all of it. I've got the gist of it. If we're going to do some sort of voting, will you have them say one, three, three again for me? Yeah, I'm going to have somebody from Adair County explain that to you. Councilor Duncan? <laughs> 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 Number one, um, it says on the edits, the relevant language currently gives the Election Commission the discretion to discard a ballot in the instance described therein, and the proposed change would give them discretion to mark the ball ballot invalid not discarded so they're talking about marking the ballot um, um, and not accepting it rather than just discarding the ballot number two um, rejects the proposed early cutoff of hand delivery of absentee ballots the Thursday before the election and restores the ability to hand deliver ballots on election day so um, if we accept number two then it would be the same of hand delivering ballots on election day. If, if we don't accept it, then it would go to what the work group talked about doing it the Thursday before the election. Uh, number three, the language currently restricts all staff of the AG's office from participating in any political campaign and the proposed change would restrict the AG and any AG's from participating in Cherokee tribal political campaigns set for voting. That's actually all about all of us. Yeah. Well, that means, I don't like it this time. I'm alone. It means to say everybody. All right, I cleared that for me, and also I got some uh, folks uh, text me what you have there in front of you. Well, they're the, they're yeah. the they're in so the force and body. You go, you go stand before I know them. That, but I'm just saying. They don't come before us. If, if everybody is. So, Keith, you're okay with one and three? Wow. Okay. Under the same rules. 
Well, but not they, they, they not, because they but not on the same boat. They can't. No. Okay. All right. Here, Any more discussion? Yes, Councilor. Worth, we, uh, Councilor Dobbins, hey, we, we got to say. Segment. Uh, we both uh, are concur with the friendly amendment on one and three. Okay. One and three. Okay, Councilor Austin, you, you as well. I do. Okay. So we concur with the friendly amendment one and three. Okay. So we can vote on that today. All right. Let's uh, let's go roll call vote on that, shall we? On what? On that one and three friendly. They accepted it as a friendly. Yeah. So it's part of the whole thing. Yeah, the whole process. thing. Yes. Now we're getting ready to vote on the. What we got to figure out on two now. Two? They I didn't know we were going to address two. No, nothing on two. No, nothing on two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other? And Shelly. Vote on the whole thing. Yes. Everybody ready? Ready to vote on the whole thing? With Just the friendly clarify, one version and three. Four that was handed out, correct? As the motion was made by Councilor Dobbins. We are ready to vote. Yes. On version four in its entirety with the two changes from the AG and administration of one and three. One and three, which is uh, subsection 72 and subsection 105. Right. Okay. Okay. <coughs> yes, Councilor Nobles. I just had a quick question. I thought I heard our legal counsel was going to make a quick clarification. Do you need something to clarify? I did. Uh, it was, she heard me. Okay. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Everybody good? Okay. So this basically says the AG's office can't campaign. Right. Yes. Rex Jordan. No. Daryl Lynn. Yes. Wes Nofire. Yes. Laura Petskowski. Yes. Mike Shambaugh. Yes. Mary Bakershaw. Yes. E.O. Smith. Yes. Denise Taylor. Yes. Victoria Vasquez. Yes. Keith Austin. Yes. Harley Buzzard. Yes. Joe Bird. Yes. Julia Coates. Yes. Sean Crittenden. Joe Deere? Yes. Mike Dobbins? Yes. It passes 16 to 1. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Councilor Dobbins, a work group, I want to commend you for, for a long uh, task to making this happen there. Appreciate you. Thank Councilor Duncan? I failed to mention earlier, too, I, um, I thought thank you, Councilor Dobbins and, and the rest of the, the work group, but also thank you to uh, our, our council. Mr. Brown, who, who worked putting all this together, so. Yeah. What else? Yes, Councilor Brown. <laughs> Councilor Smith. Brown <laughs> 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 Smith, there's a bunch of us. That's not even close. <laughs> that's a bunch of us. <laughs> well, I just want to say that if Captain Dobbins hadn't kept his cool head a couple of times and, and gave us good direction, that we would have never even come close to doing any of this. So, he did a great job. Okay. All right, let's move down to uh, count, uh, uh, hold number eight. Councilor Duncan, would you take that? Hold on, please. We, we, we voted on the uh, uh, amendments. No. Did we vote on the act on itself? The no, they were friendly, so they're already included in there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is an act amending Title 26, Section 5 of Cherokee Nation Code, annotated to recognize the traditional Cherokee names of the representative districts um and i put that in the form of the motion and i'd like to say thank you to speaker burns for bringing this forward yes um no version two i'm sorry <coughs> okay got a motion second. got a second discussion yes councilor Dunn. um since councilman crittenden isn't here sean i wanted to tell you um what make sure that we had the right thing here what we talked about for seven we had flint district and for eight we had going snake district old names oh what's that sounds good to me church okay <laughs> mr speaker yes uh yes counselor okay, Vice on the on the handout mine is still blank and so let's go ahead and put cooey scooey north in there okay eight, for lemons okay 
Yeah, I'll let <coughs> Councilor Vasquez know that if she did not have a name for her area, she could always bring it back later and we would address it in a, in a single line item there, according to our legal. Yes, Councilor Austin. Uh, you know, I'm swimming upstream on this, but I suspect, but uh, sometimes we swim upstream. What can I say? Uh, I want to point out Section 3, the purpose of this act. The purpose of this act is to amend and restate uh, Title 26.5 of the Cherokee Nation Code annotated to recognize the traditional Cherokee names of the representative districts of the Cherokee Nation. That's honorable. That's an honorable effort. Now, the names that are in front of us are Holbert, not a traditional name, Ten Killer, not a traditional name, Three Rivers, not a traditional name, Redbird, not a traditional name, uh, and Gadusi, not one of our traditional names. Uh, so, the stated purpose of the act and the actual act itself are, are in conflict, and uh, for that, I'd ask that we table this until that conflict can be resolved, because I don't see this actually is accomplishing what the act says it is uh, set out to do. Well, <coughs> I, don't want, to I just... want us to honor our history, uh, and, but I believe instead of honoring our history, we're replacing it with uh, names of our choosing. <coughs> yes, Councilor Duncan. I, I just want to respectfully respond. Um, so it says um, to recognize the traditional, traditional Cherokee names. Traditionally, um, our districts were named after something of this body's choosing, um, not, not numbered districts. Um, so I think that, to me, that's the purpose of the act. Um, that was the purpose. And, and so I, I, think it's, I think it's a good thing that we're doing this. Um, and I also like the idea of if, if someone has a name that they want to bring back to the table um, after thinking about it a little while, then we'll bring it back to the table and more than likely approve it, you know. I, I, so I, I think this is a good deal, and I, I do understand where you're coming from, Councilor, but I just want to respectfully respond to that. Thank you. Well, we have, I'm sorry, Speaker. May I? Yes, well, wait a minute. Anybody else? <clears throat> I'd like to respond to that, too. If you go out in the rural areas and, and, and you ask them if, if red bird's not traditional, Tahlequah's not traditional, Ten Killer's not traditional, I don't know how far you get with that discussion. Traditional, <laughs> according to who? They're not European part of our people or the tra traditional well, names. The, the European the traditional people or the Cherokee traditional people. To me, those names are pretty traditional. Yeah. And if you want to keep your your district with the same number or name, then really you have that prerogative. We've left that open for you. We also are. Um uh, not using the name the names Canadian and Illinois which were two of our traditional districts and that's at the council's discretion we're the legislative body we, we make the laws so anyway you got a motion did you make a motion to table uh, I don't think there's any point in it okay <laughs> All right, but your point, but Councillor Austin, your point is well taken, okay, for the record. All right, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay. Moving on down, Councillor Coates, or uh, Councillor Shaw, you want to take that? Councillor Coates? Okay. Um, no. This is an act amending Title 26, Section 78 of the Cherokee Nation Code annotated to enhance and expand the verification of identification of Cherokee citizens voting through absentee ballots. And I would move for its approval. A second. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? May I speak first to this? As the sponsor, one of them? Yes. Thank you. Um, one, what this would do, and I'm speaking because you all have it and have heard from us, so I'm speaking to the public at this point. Uh, what this would do uh, is to expand the ways that an absentee ballot could be uh, verified um, for security purposes um, in voting in the Cherokee Nation. The difficulty has been that uh, the notary requirement is burdensome to a lot of people, uh, the at-large people in particular, may only vote by absentee ballot. And, and um, 
when we're talking about what exists all across the country, Oklahoma is the only state in this country that requires a notary and only a notary. Nothing else will do. Right? So while the citizens in Oklahoma may be used to this, Councilor Shaw and I have to think about everybody all over the country. Right? And it's such a patchwork uh, of things that we wanted to uh, have some additional ways that might be uh, acceptable. So, um, so, but we also clearly understand the concerns that uh, the in-district counselors have and that their constituents have uh, for security um, of, of an absentee ballot. So we are looking for the balance between these two goals, right? To make it easier for those who find this to be a burdensome um, requirement, but also to respect and ensure the, the security concerns uh, that people do have uh, around the process of absentee voting. As I began thinking about this, and especially as I began to have conversations with some of my colleagues on the Tribal Council, I really um, respect and appreciate the, the input that, that many people gave me, the feedback, because I started to realize that not only is this a balance, but I think it's also a, a way that is perhaps even more secure in some respects than um, than to vote by uh, with a notarization. And I'm specifically talking about the, the copy of the photo ID that must be inserted in the security envelope if this uh, is passed, that that's one of the options at least, right? Um, it's very, very difficult to get a hold of someone else's photo ID with their signature on it, right, and make a copy of it if one has in mind to forge uh, an absentee <coughs> ballot of some sort. Or as a notary stamp, I had um, someone who works for tribal elections, who conducts tribal elections all over this country, including for the Chickasaw Nation, who says that in his experience, the notary stamps as they exist today, it's very easy to, um, to get one of these made, right? Um, you know, unlike the old thing that would leave an embossed seal on the envelope, and he has seen forgeries um, using that kind of notary stamp occur in tribal elections, not in ours, but in, in some others. Not in the Chickasaws, I want to say that, since I mentioned them specifically, right? Um, so I'm thinking this is actually not only a balance between the two, this is actually maybe the best of both. You know, if we can get something that is actually easier for people to have an option, we're not doing away with the notary, right? But to have an option. But it's also maybe something that's even more secure. Um, potentially. You have the documents handed out to you. They're the same ones I sent you. These are mostly about the same two issues, about the ease of voting and about fraud. And one of the things that they say, and we are hearing this in the national context as well, but is that the instances of voter fraud in this country are actually very, very small. It's .00001% <coughs> of over 250 million ballots that have been uh, cast since 2000, right? And that includes all kinds of fraud. That's not just simply fraud around a signature on a, you know, and, uh, and something that a notary might alleviate, right? That's all kinds of fraud. So the, the amount of fraud around uh, notarized ballots is only a, a portion of even that small percentage. Um, the, um, the, difficult, the difficulty for notarizing ballots for people outside of, of Oklahoma, I voted in this state as a person who was a legal resident of the state, had a legal domicile here up until 20, 2017 election, I think was the first time that I didn't. So 2017, 2019, I have voted in California. And I remember when I was on the council before, and people would, from California would say, oh, it's so hard, you know, and they would grouse about it and everything, and I'd say, just go to your bank. You know, they'll do it for free. Banks do it for free, right? And then I moved to California, <laughs> and I tried to vote, and I got it. I was like, no, banks don't do it for free there. Most banks don't even have a notary. They've got one day when a notary comes in and you have to make an appointment with them and it's two weeks from now and, you know. And if you go to other places and have something notarized, they've never seen a ballot, right? Because their state doesn't require them to notarize ballots. So you bring in a ballot to them, 
they're going to try and charge you the fee, $15, $20, whatever it may be. And unless you've got the section of the notary code in hand with you, and most of our citizens don't, of course, you know, you can't tell them that, no, you're not allowed to, to charge for this. I experienced it myself for the very first time, and I found myself running around to four different places one day trying to find a notary that would notarize my ballot and not charge me for it. Right. It is difficult. It's difficult to do. 70% of the absentee vote comes from at-large citizens in our election. It is the only way that at-large citizens can vote. The other 30% comes from in-district. But when you look at that as a portion of the overall in-district vote, it actually drops it down to something around you know, 20% of the people in district who are voting absentee. And so my suspicion is that many people don't actually understand what the whole process of voting absentee is um, in district because they don't do it. They, they walk into the polls, you know, with their norma. It certainly, that was mine too when I lived here, right? But, um, so I think that, that there's maybe not a good understanding of what that process is, which leads to the perceptions that somehow there's widespread fraud going on around the notary, right? Now, I, I am fortunate to have had conversations with several of you where you described what kinds of things had happened in the elections in your, in your districts and so forth. And I, I get it, you know, I see what you're saying. I think there are things in what we just passed that can alleviate some of that. But as I listened and what I said to a couple of people is, none of that has to do with the notary per se, right? That's some other issue uh, rather than the issue around the notary. So, um, so there's that. My last thing, and I know I'm speaking a long time here, but I'm, I just want to say and then I want to listen. Um, we heard from Dr. Gann and Ms. Pivik this morning uh, a number of things about the coronavirus in Oklahoma and in the Cherokee Nation. And what I heard, and I wrote things down because it was pretty shocking to me, some of them, that this state is not making any changes in the way that it's approaching this, even though Oklahoma is number four in the nation now in terms of coronavirus infection rates. And so the expectation is that since the virus is all over the place, it's out of control, those are their words, right, and the state is not making any changes, that it may be the middle of next summer before we get this thing under control, if we're lucky. That's what they said, if we're lucky. Dr. Fauci says he thinks it's going to be more like the end of next year, that we may have a vaccine that is widespread and widely available, and so forth. Ms. Pivik's comment was, we went into this with high rates of chronic disease. It makes us more susceptible and continues to do so. And we know that, right? We know we've got disproportionately high rates of comorbidities, obesity, diabetes, uh, hypertension, heart disease, um, CPD, is that what it's called, the pulmonary disease, right, COPD, and, um, and uh, cancer, right. So, and then Mr. Inlow's remark was about the, um, about the elders and the speakers that were losing, and age being over 65 is one of the top comorbidities of this disease. And we don't have any assurance that this is gonna be gone by the time we're voting next year. And I think that, for me, this is something that has really moved to the forefront of this argument, is that we need to make it as easy as possible for those who are the most vulnerable in our society to vote at home, right? To vote absentee and to not have to leave the house, to not have to go to a bank and be face to face with a notary, to not have to do that uh, in order to weigh in as part of um, their, their right. 
So those are, those are just the points I, I wanted to make, and I thank everyone for, for the phone calls that Councillor Shaw and I have been making and the conversations that you've had with us about this. And, um, and I look forward to, to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> okay. You had a motion. Do we have a second, Shelley? Yes. Okay. Uh, Councillor Taylor. I'd like to um, offer a friendly to this, Julia, if possible. Mm -hmm. I'm, the notary, I think, needs to stay just because that's the way we've always done it. I have some heartburn about just two w witnesses um, saying you are who you are. And I also um, am not real comfortable with the Cherokee Nation voter ID. I would propose that if, you're, if you are so inclined to strike those two things, leave the notary or leave a copy of a government issued, valid government issued photo ID to go along with it. Yeah, I would accept that as a friend. Mm -hmm. Okay. The friend of the, I'm sorry. We're still, we're still, we're still in discussion, okay? There's yes, Councilor Dahl. From Councilor Taylor. You second. Taylor, did you say a, a notary and a photo ID? Okay, she's got several different, Shelly, do you have a summary there? I, I think you were getting ready to say, what, what I want to strike is presence of two witnesses or Cherokee Nation voter, uh, and I've marked through so it on mine, so now I'm striking out I, I, and in the, what's the next one? Um, Cherokee Nation voter card. So I'd like for it to be a government issued photo ID, valid government issued photo ID, not expired, or notary. Or notary? Or. 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 Yeah, it's got to be or. <coughs> or. or. Otherwise, we're making it even harder. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, Councilor Dobbins. Oh, uh, just, I'm a strong uh, proponent of voter ID. We ask someone to go in to vote at the, uh, on election day, they have to present their ID to the precinct worker. And I just view the notary, uh, that absentee voter, we ought to ask them to do the same thing, to present a photo ID, have them acknowledge, yes, that is this voter. I just feel like the notary is the strongest form of voter ID we can have in our absentee elections. And I don't know what next year will bring as a matter of safety issues, but I know our election commission is prepared if we get to that point to make sure all the credit unions and banks throughout are willing to offer free notary service drive through so our citizens aren't exposed physically to a notary. So, uh, and there's also technology called a remote notary that could be upon us by the time next year comes. So in view of that, I'm just a strong proponent right now in our system. The notary, I believe, gives us the strongest form of voter ID. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> okay. Yes, Count. Uh, Tim, what do you got to add? Oh, Speaker, I was just coming up here to help clarify uh, if, if needed. I don't, okay. I don't have anything to uh, add. AG? I just wanted to, uh, to pass along that I know the principal chief um, had discussed this issue with the Secretary of State of California, uh, trying to get some clarification on the issue that uh, Councilwoman Coates raised about people, uh, you know, saying that they were being charged for having ballots notarized, and, and he had a discussion with them, and, and they clarified, I think, what the councilwoman, you know, said as well, that it is illegal in California for them to charge people to notarize their ballots. Um, and he talked to the California Secretary of State about finding a way to better educate the notaries in California about the ballot process in Cherokee Nation. So I wanted to pass that along to all of you that he had reached out to have that conversation. And uh, regardless of the outcome here, I think that that's probably going to be beneficial for our California citizens. So I wanted to just pass that along to all of you. Okay. Somebody over here? Yeah. I was just to clarify, which which one are we striking on this friendly? I want to strike um, two, two, I. two witnesses. Yes, I, I. And then I also don't like the use of Cherokee Nation voter identification card because there's no photo on that. Right. So, so it's, all of, it's all of I, I. Speaking of I, 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 I believe I, what she's going to do is, is limit it to uh, Okay, just the government notary. issue. 
you just want to keep the notary requirement and then basically in the alternative of a notary uh in the presence of one witness and enclose a copy of your government issued photo id okay okay yes councillor austin you were up yes uh the legislation as proposed this is where my heartburn is with it is uh, it's it asked for a witness and that whether it's one witness or two witnesses it asked for a witness um, yeah but we have we have no way in my thinking of, of policing fraud I don't I think fraud is extraordinarily low in this country but but we have no avenue for policing fraud for non-citizens who live elsewhere it, it, madam attorney general can you help me understand do we have any authority to police uh, or to um, prosecute somebody who did commit fraud in those circumstances? Well, the nation's you know, criminal authority over individuals is limited to Indians who commit crimes on Indian country, which could be on the reservation, or on tribal trust, or restricted land. Outside of that, it is quite difficult. I mean, the nation doesn't have jurisdiction, crim criminal, does not have criminal jurisdiction over those individuals. The only jurisdictional basis there could possibly be would be civil, um, and that has its own limitations. That, that's, that's where I've been back and forth on this for a few days, and uh, that's where my my heartburn has been is uh, uh, we don't have any avenue to enforce it in case there was fraud. Uh, with the notary, those folks have taken an oath to uh, that we could fall back on to have them held accountable. But there's no way for us to actually hold people accountable for fraud in that instance, in my understanding. Okay, Councilor Shandler. Um, so basically you either get the the ballot absent or notarized or there can be two witnesses and a photo id one, either or one, or one, one, one witness, witness and a photo id, and a photo ID. uh i travel photo id no uh, no it could be your driver's license government issue well and even at that how do how does that person even, if it's a government, how does he even know you're a citizen of the Cherokee Nation? I mean, what are you, what are you attesting to? So and I think, you know, you try to make... signature. Well, maybe so, but you don't know that that person is a citizen or not. No, you don't, but neither all does a notary. Of, uh, yeah, go. I'm sorry, it's just neither does a notary would have knowledge if that person's a Cherokee citizen or not. It, uh, that's going to be, yeah. I mean, that's just out there as it is. Yeah, I, I think that's, I... I have a problem with that too for the simple reason of um, if you're relying on Joe Blow saying that the, I mean if you're if you're trying to to make things harder for people to cheat and then you give them another avenue to cheat I mean that's just it's too easy and, and you're just giving them more opportunities to do that I, I just think that's you know I, I just I have a hard time I don't have this problem in my district so maybe I look at it differently but um, I think you're just giving people the, the more opportunity to be dishonest. And it makes it easier. Okay. My thoughts. All right. <clears throat> Councilor Shaw. Yes, I just wanted to say, you know, address what Councilor Austin was talking about, not being able to follow through if somebody committed fraud. You know, this last election, there was a situation where I think a couple of the uh, candidates committed fraud, uh, said by the election commission, and yet there was not anywhere to take it outside of our marshal service. I mean, so they really weren't charged with anything that resulted in anything. And that was a candidate. And so to worry about a vote, I think, based on that level, you know, you might want to rethink that. But the other thing is I want to thank Councillor Taylor for making this a friendly. And I'd like to call for the vote. Mm -hmm. Councillor Pauskowski. Okay, so drop on down to where the affidavit envelope must be, A, notarized, then you would be dropping off B, signed by the two witnesses, or C, signed by the one witness and included an enclosed copy of the government issue. So what if you made it where the person, the witness, or, or is this saying that the witness as well as the voter both have to 
submit a copy of their government issued photo ID? Are we saying just the voter does or are we saying both of them do? Only the voter. Just the voter. So what if you made the witness also submit their does that carry any more validity or you would hope the witness is of good character, you just don't <laughs> you don't know, but I mean at least you would be making him submit his sure. ID as well. And we're just saying the word government. What government? Any. It could be a driver's license or federal passport. ID. Passport. Government. Passport. Well, if it can be any government, then why can't it be a Cherokee Nation card? Because the Cherokee be. Nation is a government. It can be. But we're marking that no, out. We're no, marking we're marking the voter ID. Voter ID. Voter ID. Not, we're not saying that. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're still in discussion. Councilor Deer. <laughs> I know we've had a lot of different things going around, but I mean, we still remember we they have to request the absentee ballot. I don't, I don't know. That, that's the first thing. Right. Second thing, Councilor Cousins, I want to recommend in Tulsa they have remote notaries. And I, if you could do a friendly amendment with that to add that, because that that would also be that option because they have the remote notary signature. So. I mean, we can we can add all day, but I'm saying that if you're going to have a notary, just have a remote notary. It's going to be safer as well. It's already in place, and the state does do two witnesses. That's all I had, Speaker. Okay, let me. I'm going to bring something up here. What group? I know you consider this. Why did you not rec recommend this? This legislation. Well, this was Councilor Coates. Well, yeah, this is individually recommended. The work group didn't recommend it. <laughs> there was. Yeah, uh, uh, Councilor Dobbins. Councilor Dobbins, I want you to answer that. No, I, just, with, I just want clarity on uh, Councilor Taylor's friendly. Yeah, I know what a friendly is. They do too. She but why do we not. Requirement of a notary. <coughs> no. Another no, option? No, 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 I'm not. You can still get it notarized well, know, but, always. But you don't have to. Exactly. You get, you vote get some kind of other ID, alternative ID, other than a notary. So your friendly is eliminating the requirement of a notary. You don't have to have a notary if we accept your friendly. Let's see the order. Why are the other? I can't change that. I believe in voter ID. Well, I would ask you, it, how's somebody going to get a hold of your driver's license? Pardon me? How's somebody going to get a hold of your driver's license, take a copy of it, and put it in your, your voter um, envelope? Huh? Without your knowledge. Well, probably not, but, but yeah. you may have a family member that's able to do that. Maybe. You know, other than that individual. With the, with the I'm still hearing a lot of questions here. We don't seem very united here. It I seems pretty close. Uh, well, I think Julia accepts the most. I think we've had everybody have their input, this side and this side. All right, so shall we explain where we are? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a motion and a second, and then Councilor Taylor yeah, uh, friendly. Did recommended a friendly. And they've accepted it. And they accepted it. it. They did accept your friendly. Yes. Okay. If there's no more discussion on the overall amendment, then we're ready to vote. Okay. And Go ahead and read the, hey, yeah. that part so they're clear. Okay. Any yeah. subsection 78, return of absentee ballots in the red part. Um, it would be I, I Republic, I, I is stricken, I, I, I is in the presence of one witness, an enclosed copy of a government issued photo identification. The rest of that would be stricken. And then it says the affidavit envelope must be A, notarized, and the notary seal affixed to the affidavit, B, signed by two witnesses, or C, signed by one witness. Mm -hmm. Yes, B would be signed by two witnesses. Mm -hmm. okay. C, signed by one witness, and included and enclosed the government issued photo ID. Okay. All right. All right. Let's call for a uh, <coughs> roll call vote. Did you leave on where it says for their Cherokee Nation issue voter ID or is that true? No, that's different. That's different. Yes, to accept the friendly? No, the whole thing. 
Okay, with everything included. Hang on just okay. a minute. Um, Councillor Deer had made a friendly, and it was about the remote notary. And I wanted to, um, I'm not aware of these, but do you? I've, no. I've not ever seen one either. I haven't yeah. seen it. It's coming. All right, I'll accept it. Yeah, Councilor Schwartz. I don't know what to do until It's for presence of the notary public or a remote notary. Stay with yours. I don't think we vote on something that's coming. You can pass it. No, we're getting ready to your friendly. Okay, I'll accept it. No, we're getting ready to. You're friendly. All right, we're voting on uh, Janice is friendly here. Okay. Okay. Well, we're voting on the whole legislation. We are. With, yeah. with, the, friendly. Friendly. with the friendly. Okay. All right, Shelly. Okay. Janice's friendly is accepted by Julia and Mary. Okay. So, we're doing a roll call vote on the entire amendment with Janice's friendly. Uh, Dora Petskowski. Yes. Mike Shambaugh. No. Mary Baker Shaw. Yes. E.O. Smith. No. Janice Taylor. Yes. Victoria Vasquez. Yes. Keith Austin. No. Carly Buzzard. Yes. Joe Bird. No. Julia Coates. Yes. Sean Crittenden. Yes. Joe Deer. Yes. Mike Dobbins. No. Kanan Duncan. No. Rex Jordan. No. Darrell Leigh? Yes. West Nobody? Yes. We have 10 to 7, it passes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, all right. Any announcements to my right? <laughs> announcements to my left? Okay. All in favor? It's adjourned. We are